So I'd like to start with a question. Uh, here's something that has always bothered me, and, and, and it's uh, something that I've seen over and over again as a manager in, in, in my life in managing in organizations and as a management consultant. Why do your best managers go home every night with a full briefcase, feeling badly about what they didn't get done that day, instead of feeling good about what they did get done? So why do your best managers go home every night with a full briefcase feeling badly about what they didn't get done instead of feeling good about what they did get done? So what does the research say? My own experience, my consulting work has been in a variety of organizations from startups to large complex organizations and all of the evidence does tell me that there is an issue here. But any good organizational system should be grounded in research. It shouldn't be somebody else's good idea. So I spent two years reading to try to get beneath the surface. I'd like to start with uh, um, a, a cons well, he's a social scientist and, and an author. He also did a lot of consulting. Unfortunately, he passed away nine years ago, but he has over 50 years of research into human capability and organizational systems. And in addition to that, there's thousands of supporting studies that support his work. And Elliot felt that organizations are only reali realizing 20 to 30% of their capability. Now I, now I admit that Elliot can be a bit provocative, but in many situations, I don't think he's far off. A second um, author I'd like to talk about is Jerry Cranes. Uh, I haven't met Jerry personally, but I've read a lot of his work, and I've really re it, it really resonated with me in terms of the things that he said. So I've, uh, I've found that his findings over a lifetime of consulting are that employees are spending 60% of their time doing things that they weren't hired to do. So again, as I said, this resonates with everything that I know as a manager. People are going to meetings that they shouldn't have to attend. Uh, they're, they're reading email that they shouldn't have to read. They're doing work that was already assigned to someone else. Uh, they're trying to resolve conflicts with colleagues in other parts of the organization. They're redoing work that wasn't properly explained the first time. Uh, they're chasing colleagues who haven't, uh, who've missed deadlines and, and they need their work to be able to do their own and, and so on. It's, it's a very long list. So I've lived this in organizations and, and I bet that you have two in different organizations that you've worked in. Uh, so I, I could give you a lot of examples, uh, but we need to move on. So if anyone wants more information about this, do check out my website. I've got a number of articles there that, that talk about the situations that managers are, are facing. The bottom line though, is that our organizational systems are failing us. Something is systematically getting in the way of people being as effective as they can uh, in the work that they do in organizations. And it matters. 70% of employees leave a job for reasons related to factors that are directly controllable by their managers. And work groups that are not managed effectively are 50% less productive and 44% less profitable. So helping managers to be more effective in their work can make a difference to organizational performance. There's no question about that. And that translates into organizations getting more and better results in, in their own objectives. And yet, as I referred to the two years of reading that I've done in this, it has not been quantified in research. So Effective Managers is partnering with the Telfer School of Management to do some research into this to, to try to understand what are the drivers bef between manager effectiveness and, and uh, people being able to work as well as they can in their organizations. What, are, what, are, what is the quantification of this? How effective are managers really in their work or how, how much of a, of a gap there is between uh, current situation and practices and what they could be achieving if systems weren't getting in their way? I'll come back to the research uh, a bit later in this presentation. So that's the opening part. I, th I think there is a, a, a very real issue that most organizations face. I think uh, managers carry the weight of not being able to be as effective as they can in organizations when, when they want to be as effective as they can. Uh, and I'd like to now move on to talking about it from the perspectives of the CEO, the head of HR, and then the manager, him or herself. So if you think about CEOs in general, 
they face pressure to create more profit or, or more outputs in not-for-profit organization uh, with fewer resources. Uh, they have to deliver more results in, in less time and, and, and they're, they're trying to meet rising shareholder or, or stakeholder uh, expectations. So what often happens is that systems that the CEOs have put in place or, or that should put in place to support managers don't get the attention that they deserve. So I'd like to spend a, a, a few minutes on each of these four perspectives from uh, the, uh, each of these four aspects from the situation of the CEO. And uh, I, I do recognize that all of you on the call are not CEOs, but understanding the role of the CEO can also help you understand your role as a manager in an organization. So the first one is strategic planning. The organization's strategic plan is the CEO's own business plan. The CEO is accountable to the board for recommending a strategy uh, to the organization and, and on behalf of the organization. So it's to the board for the organization. And most organizations really are pretty good at, at developing their strategies and most boards are pretty attentive to, uh, to ensuring that, that strategies are in place in the organization. But, but here's a quote for you. It's too good not to repeat. Strategic planning is too important to leave to the top of the organization. I can't find the originator of that quotation. It's probably because it is a truism, but the organization's strategic plan must inform and drive planning throughout the entire organization. So second, strategy implementation. Most organizations do a very poor job of implementing their strategies. The implementation of strategy requires more discipline and concentrated effort than the planning exercise. Uh, this has to be part of the CEO and in, in many cases, uh, once the strategy is in place at the CEO's level, there's not sufficient attention given to informing and driving the setting, obtaining and measurement of objectives throughout the rest of the organization. So in terms of me as a manager somewhere in the middle of the organization, how is my day-to-day -day work? How are my objectives? How are my, my deliverables driven by the strategy of the organization? And what is my relationship between myself and my manager to ensure that this is happening? Third, the CEO is, is also accountable for all of the organization-wide systems. Um, what often happens is that the, the system CEOs have put in place uh, really aren't getting uh, the focused attention that a CEO needs to, to give to them. So they're seen as support services within the organization. Uh, they're seen as doing good work, but there's not often enough attention given to the relationship between those support services and the outputs of the uh, operations arms of the organization. So as a result, there's unnecessary churn in the organization and it results in, uh, in managers who are spending you know, too much of their time doing tasks that they weren't uh, engaged to do. So, uh, so I'd like to talk for one minute about churn. It's not a highly technical term, uh, but it is one that uh, that does have uh, have uh, you know some use. I think it's 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 a it's a useful descriptor of of what happens in the organizations. So if, uh, uh, if you think about a hypothetical organization, I've put one up on your screen. So at the top you have a CEO, the next level down you have some vice presidents, uh, then the next level below that you have some directors. There would probably be a couple of more uh, layers of uh, managers and frontline workers in, in an organization like this. So on the left of the screen, uh, we have a CFO. On the right of the screen, let's say we have a vice president of, of uh, operations. So let's think about a director of finance on, on the left side, and I'll give you a hypothetical situation where the director has a report that's due tomorrow. The CFO feels this is a really important report. Um, it's going to the uh, chief executive officer's management team that next day. It relies on current information, so the director has to go to operations the day before the report is, is due, gather that information, compile it, and, uh, and get it to the CFO so it can be presented at, at the meeting the next day. So the CFO uh, doing his, uh, I'm sorry, the director of finance uh, doing his or her job asks the person over here in operations uh, for the information that they, they need uh, to compile that report. But in over in operations, there's been a, a situation has developed um, it's an emergency that the vice president of operations says is a number one priority and that the uh, director needs to resolve that, um, that issue immediately. 
So this is what I call churn. We have two, two directors in the organization. Each one of them has a quite valid deliverable that they're accountable for. Each of their bosses quite validly expects them to be able to deliver that. Um, but one of them depends on the other to be able to get that information and the other's not available. In most organizations, those two directors would be left to work it out themselves. And that's what I call churn because without better, clearer understanding of what the accountabilities are, uh, they're just not able to get onto the work. So I'm going to come back, uh, come back to this in a minute because I think it's really important, but I just wanted to give you the concept of churn because too often systems just have those kind of unintended uh, consequences in organizations. So why is this happening? Um, fourth, fourth item of why is this happening? Uh, CEOs need to attend to and, um, and, and, and really think about accountability and authority frameworks. So if you only take one thing away from today's presentation, uh, make it this one. The Chief Executive Officer is accountable for ensuring that the organization has accountability and authority frameworks for how work is delegated down the organization and how work flows across the organizations. So this has to be an accountability of the CEO to ensure that accountability and authority frameworks exist both down and across the organization. This is so fundamental to effective management that I'm going to spend the next few slides elaborating what I mean by this. First of all, accountability is not typically clear in organizations. Most, you know, it almost appears that most organizations work at, at trying to make accountability less clear. They have language in organizations like champions, steering groups, committees. I've seen in many organizations where where uh, where uh, managers didn't know who their who their manager was. Um, that um, there's there's concepts like taking ownership of of, uh, of different aspects of the organization. There are self-managed teams. There there are multiple managers, such as functional managers and line managers, which which create lack of clarity. And the research literature is almost as bad. There are only a handful of researchers that I've been able to found that are publishing on managerial accountability in organizations. And even worse. And I couldn't believe this, they even create their own definitions and sometimes multiple definitions for accountability uh, within the same, within the same uh, research paper. So in order to advance knowledge in, in management sciences, we need standard definitions. Uh, if you think about physics, uh, they have mass, velocity, speed. If, if, you're, if you're writing a research paper in physics or you're trying to advance knowledge in physics, you don't have to define what, uh, what speed is. You know, that, that's, that's a given. It's a known. Even chefs have, have standards of measure. So if you're reading a recipe, you know what a fluid ounce is, you know what a cup is, you know what a, what a milliliter is. But the management sciences, unfortunately, are, are different. Um, Elliot Jacks uh, referred to this, uh, to the management sciences actually as alchemy, because he felt we were at, at a stage in, in sciences where, where everybody was doing their own thing and there were really no standard understandings and, and, and definitions. So uh, as I say, accountability doesn't even have a commonly accepted definition in the literature. Um, if, if, if you even think about the concept of accountability in the French language, there isn't a word for, uh, for accountability. So in the handful of cases where I have found researchers that are seriously uh, researching in this area, they, they do define it uh, in their own way. So, uh, so because accountability is so central to management systems, I'd like to uh, walk through you quickly with, uh, with a definition that I think is a good working definition uh, that can help managers in, in thinking about, uh, about their work and how they delegate work. So accountability is an obligation for which one can be held to account for one's results and one's actions by a specified other. So there's three aspects to this that are important. The first one is that it's an obligation. Uh, the second is that you can be called to account for results and actions. And the third one is the, the concept of a specified other, which is critical. Uh, if you're missing that specified other, it's not accountability. I, I would call that responsibility. Um, so let me give you an example. If you're, if you're driving along a road and, and there's a, a, a rock that's in, the, in one of the driving lanes that's just come down off of uh, the side of the road, um, you can get around it, but 
you don't know whether the person behind you is going to see it in time and will be able to get around it. There's not a lot of traffic, so so you get out, move the rock off the road, and just push it into the ditch. Not not a big deal. Uh, probably wouldn't be life threatening, but if somebody hit it with a tire, they could have a flat tire and and could be in trouble. So I would define that as a responsibility. That's that's your self felt desire to to help out some unknown other uh, in this world by by uh, by stopping and doing that the accountability for for keeping that road clear would would rest with the public works department and there would be a supervisor of public works who would be accountable for doing that work in in uh, in a work setting uh, let's imagine that your coworker is is having trouble connecting to uh, to a particular program uh, on their computer. Uh, you had the same issue the day before. You see that they're floundering with that, so so you go over to their desk and say, "I can help you with that." And in in a couple of minutes, you've you've resolved the issue for that. Again, that you're not accountable for that. That was something that you felt responsible to do because you had the knowledge and and could help out your work your coworker. Uh, the accountability, though, would have rested with uh, with the help department in uh, in in, uh, in in IT. So I think keeping these two uh, these two uh, concepts separate is important, and thinking about con accountability in terms of being held to account for one's results by a specified other uh, becomes really important. So in an employment situation, accountability needs to describe this relationship between a manager and a, and a direct report. So the manager can delegate work in a variety of ways. Uh, the direct report manager can do work in a variety of ways, uh, but the manager can always call to account the direct report manager with with respect to the work that's assigned. So, what are you doing? Uh, is the work how how you know is is the work done right? Is it the right level of quality? Is it in the right time frame? And so on. So that direct report manager is accountable for doing the work to the satisfaction of the manager. But what we find is that in organizations, all other kinds of, of uh, things get in the way. And I, I call those felt accountabilities because individuals feel them as if they were accountabilities, but they're not real accountabilities. So you can have a functional manager, for instance. Um, you might have customers to whom uh, you have uh, important interactions. Uh, there are colleagues uh, that you work with closely. Um, you could have projects that you're also accountable for. There could be some self-held uh, beliefs that, that, that would drive uh, the way you work in, in the workplace. And then finally, you have your own employees who may be managers who, or who may be uh, frontline employees that you're accountable for doing work for. So, so I like to think of these as, as being felt by the direct report because they're important. All of these things are important to take into account, but they're not real accountabilities. Remember the differentiation I made between uh, responsibility and and accountability. So uh, so given that they're all important aspects of work life, the manager needs to set context for direct report managers in terms of how one interacts with with each one of these individuals, but make it absolutely clear that the accountability is to the manager and not to other aspects of the organization. So let me get back to the CEO then in terms of thinking about accountability. If we uh, start at the top of the organization, uh, we have the chief executive officer. Uh, the CEO is delegated specific accountability and authority uh, from the board and is held to account for those accountabilities by the board. So the strategic plan is typically the most the, the vehicle most often used to do this and delivering results against that strategic plan are the measurements uh, for which the board would hold the CEO to account. Uh, the CEO then delegates accountability and authority to his or her direct reports and sets context and boundaries on, on how that work is going to be done. So that's the uh, that's the blue umbrella that you set you see here. So I, I use the blue umbrella to describe context and boundaries. So the context is is how one does the work, and the boundaries are are those limits within which you should be doing the work. So then this this cascades down the organization through a series of intervening managers until you come to yourself as a manager, for instance, and your direct report uh, managers. So as, as an aside here, I've picked uh, five layers of, uh, of, 
of management in this organization. It could be two or three layers of, of managers. It could be five, six, or seven, but the concept is the same, is that the CEO needs to have a framework in the organization so that delegation is crystal clear and with within a framework that's set by the manager's manager all the way down so that you have these nested uh, context uh, and boundary statements. So what would be the main symptom of a lack of managerial accountability uh, in an organization? I find that it's most often described as poor communication. Managers won't often come back to you and say we have an inadequate uh, managerial accountability and authority framework. But they, what they may do is come back to you and say, boy, communication in this organization really sucks. I was working on this project for the last uh, three weeks and I just found out that somebody over in this other department uh, uh, that, uh, that, that you also manage is, uh, is, doing, uh, is doing the same kind of work. Or they might feel that uh, they're not getting sufficient direction to be able to make the decisions that they need in, in, uh, in doing their work. Or they may feel that their decisions made higher in the organization that they need to be able to effectively do their, their work that they're not, they're not aware of. So the manager is the most important uh, relationship that, uh, that, that any individual has uh, in the organization and they need information in, in a good way uh, for them to be able to make the decisions that they need uh, to do their work. So it's often thought of as communication and it's, that is often a, a symptom of, uh, of a lack of clear accountability and authority and clear delegation uh, in the organization. And the CEO also needs to set this accountability in a framework for, for work that flows across the organization. Um, if, if, uh, if, let's go back to our churn example here, actually. If, if we remember our friends in, uh, in uh, finance and, uh, and operations. So instead of the directors of finance and operations having to, quotation marks, work it out between them with this report, uh, the hypothetical report that I talked to you about, what needs to happen in the organization around support systems, such as this finance report that the CEO feels is important to have at the executive management team level. Um, the CEO needs to set common context. You see the blue umbrella here for the CFO and, and the uh, vice president of operations with respect to this report and how important or not that report is so that when the CFO is delegating to the finance, uh, the finance director and the VP of operations is delegating to the uh, operations director, that they're getting the same message uh, with respect to the importance of that report. Uh, so that when a situation such as the uh, emergency in operations comes up, uh, the director of operations could say to the vice president of operations, uh, you know, I know this is an, an emergency, my number one priority, but we just have, we have this report that's due today that, that finance needs. You told me it's a really important report. What are we going to do about that? So there could be a, a number of, of different um, um, results from this, but the key is, is that it's not the director is trying to fight it out on, on the floor to figure out how this work is going to be done. It really is the context that each of them are set by their respective managers. So they could decide that the report isn't important. We can delay it a few days. Um, by the, you know, the, actually the CFO and, and the vice president of operations could go to the CEO and say, do you really need this report? Uh, sometimes I've seen these kinds of escalations result in, in, uh, in, in, in stopping work and, and uh, doing things that aren't as, as necessary. Um, on the other hand, it could be a very high priority and, and the VP of operations could then work with the director to find other resources to, to handle the emergency and, and also get the report done. So the point is, is that rather than having churn in the organization, if the CEO has an accountability and authority framework that goes across the organization that helps people understand how they work with, with, with each other and you can get clear delegation of accountability and authority down uh, different parts of the organization, then you're, you've gone a long way to eliminating that churn that gets in the way of, uh, of work being done effectively. So what is the symptom of a lack of clear uh, cross-functional accountability framework? It's silos. So again, individuals tend to see uh, work as being done in silos uh, when the, this accountability and authority framework isn't in place and they see it as silos because if, if you don't trust the results that you may be getting and expecting from others, then people tend to kind of just, you know, 
put their arms around the work that needs to be done and, and, and do it themselves. So if, if it becomes a, an atmosphere in the organization. If I don't own it, I can't control it. And, and those are silo building uh, behaviors that impede progress in the organization. So this is my last thought on this subject, and then we're going to move into the next area. Um, if we think about clarity of accountability, that leads to clarity of action and clarity of interaction. And if you have clarity of action delegated down the organization and you have clarity of interaction for how work flows across the organization, then there will be consistency in results. And paradoxically, this, this does not mean sameness or, or rigidity in an organization. Uh, when some people see uh, my characters lined up down the right side of the screen as you did before, they say, well, that's, that, that's, that's a bit too rigid. And in fact, what we're trying to do is, is ensure clarity of delegation, clarity of understanding of accountability and authority, clarity of boundaries, in other words, limits on what you can do, so that you have the freedom of action to, to use your best efforts to make decisions, to take initiatives, to do the work that you feel is important to do, but do it in such a way that it's consistently supporting the strategy of the organization and consistently supporting uh, the, uh, the initiatives from the CEO on down that are going to move the organization in the same same uh, direction. So I'd like to move on uh, briefly to the head of HR and then, and then we'll move on to uh, managers themselves. So from the head of HR there's there's three points that I think that I think are important to think about in terms of uh, effective management. The first one is being a champion for effectiveness. In other words our, our objectives which are usually linked to of some type of performance management system, are objectives linked clearly back to the organization's strategic plan or are or, or, or performance management objectives just sort of brought in as part of the performance management system itself? If it's the latter, uh, then that is not contributing towards effectiveness. There has to be a very clear link between, between objectives and performance and how those link to, to moving the organization towards its strategy. The second is, is helping managers learn how to be managers. If you think about it, who teaches managers how to manage? Invariably, you know, after you get out, if you get your MBA or, or, or you become a first line manager uh, through experience, uh, you're, you're learning through the examples that are set by your previous managers. So what systems and processes can HR put in place to support appropriate managerial leadership practice and doing that within an accountability and authority framework? And then the third one links back somewhat to the first one, and that is shift, shift your thinking from performance management to managerial effectiveness. So, so, so how, how can we help others in the organization become more effective and more, more, more productive? help the shift to take place so that, so that the HR systems, including the performance management system, are actually demonstrably uh, helping the organization to be more effective. And through those kinds of efforts, HR can have a real impact on, on the bottom line of the organizations. And in many cases, in organizations where they're seen as a, a cost center or one of the soft services, if you will, they can, they, the, the, the value added benefit of HR activities can be seen and understood. So moving on to, uh, on to managers themselves. There's an increasing frustration at, at the manager level. Uh, managers are spending more and more of their time in the trenches and not doing the actual managerial work or, or value added work uh, that, that they feel they need to be doing to, uh, to, to do their work effectively. So they're not seeing real substantive changes as a result of most of the efforts that they put in. And in many cases, they're not even feeling connected to the overall strategy of, of, of the company if, if they even know what it is. So the expectations that are being placed upon them are, aren't being met, and, and this just uh, exacerbates that, uh, that frustration. And then because they, they don't feel that uh, they're connected and because they are pulled in so many directions, it's, it's easy to lose, the, uh, lose sight of the main purpose of their work. So what do effective managers do differently? Well, they set context and boundaries, they plan, they delegate, they do value-added work, 
and the create feedback loops. I know nothing new there. Uh, these are, you, you've heard all of this before from, from Drucker's earliest writings on up. These, these are the generic key elements of, of what a manager needs to do to be able to do their work effectively. Uh, to be able to do their work, I'm sorry, but to be effective, they have to do this within that organizational wide accountability framework. So what I'd like to do in the next few slides for each one of these areas is just quickly go through and talk to the difference of what happens in most organizations in each of these five areas and how it might vary uh, if it's done within an organization wide accountability framework. So coming back to the, uh, the chart that we built before And thinking about the managerial accountability framework, the manager sets the context and the boundaries. So these are the blue umbrellas that uh, that I talked uh, talked about before. The manager needs to ensure that direct report managers have the resources they need to do their jobs. So in terms of setting context and boundaries, part part of the context is this is your job, uh, these are your deliverables, but part of it is also, you know, what are what are you specifically accountable for doing? Uh, what is the authority that you have to do that job? Uh, this is the context that you have to make decisions that align with uh, with my own objectives, if I'm the manager speaking to you. Uh, these are the boundaries within which the work must be done. And then finally, these, these are objectives with uh, QQTR measures. Uh, the QQTR is a concept that Elliot Jacks writes about, and, and um, I'd just like to spend one quick minute on that. So, so these these become important parts of delegation to individuals. So it's not just do this; uh, it's achieve this objective uh, with the, these four criteria. The first one is what is the level of quality that I expect as your manager? What is the quantity that I expect as your manager? What is the timeliness for for doing this work? And finally, what are the resources that you have available to do this work? And this should be a discussion point between the manager and direct report on each of these dimensions so that there's absolute clarity in terms of objectives as, as to what is the quality, quantity, timeliness, and resources. So the QQTR I've found to be a very helpful uh, discussion uh, and, and shorthand of, of ensuring that delegation is clear. So the second dimension was planning, and all managers' plans need to be linked to the organization's overall strategic plan. So each direct report manager also needs a plan. So if I'm the CEO, I have the strategic plan, so that's not an issue. Uh, but as the CEO, I would want each of my vice presidents to also have a plan uh, that would be uh, describing what they're going to be achieving within an appropriate time frame and levels of quality and quantity and and uh, and also the resources that they would need to do that work so that as the CEO I would have full confidence that the consolidated effort of my vice presidents is going to produce the results that I need so I can do my value-added work and 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 uh, deliver the strategy that I that I need that then needs to flow down the organization so that at each level uh, this is happening and that each plan is within the context of, of the plan that's above it. Then we get on to delegation, and here we need to delegate the work uh, that direct report managers need to do and what they need to, to do for success. So we've already talked about that. I got a little carried away with one of my earlier slides, so I won't go through this one in, in as much detail. But, but delegation needs to be within that context that's set by the manager's manager. So again, you have this, this context coming down and each, each umbrella uh, is, is a subset of the context that, that is above it. And then there's the doing. So now it's, now it's time to get down to work. So executing uh, the goals to support Strategy implementation requires all of the good things that managers need to do with their direct reports. So, so they need effective teamwork of their teams, and they need to to ensure that they're they're delegating appropriately. Um, they also need to uh, to be able to ensure uh, that they're um, they're uh, helping their employees understand their boundaries, resolving conflicts, and so on. But in addition to doing that, they have to be sure that, and this is very important, they have to be sure that they're doing the value added work that they need to do at their level. And that's easier said than done because in, in, in the day-to-day -day operations of an organization, so much is going on all the time 
uh, that that it's very easy to be distracted by the day to day and never get down to the the value added um, important work uh, that needs to be done where where only you at your your level in the organization are able to create that extra value so that the organization strategy can be appropriately implemented. And then the fourth area are, uh, is, uh, is feedback loops. So, so managers do need to get information from a, a variety of sources. Uh, they need to do their performance management with their subordinate managers. They need to do coaching uh, and, and they need to gather information from all kinds of sources to be able to do that. And then based on that feedback, they need to be able to, uh, to modify or, or change um, um, their course of action based on the feedback that they have. So managers need to build those feedback loops, whether they're within their team, uh, with their manager, with, uh, with other organizations, with other departments within their organization, but they're, they're essential to doing the work. So it's the collective of managers throughout the organization that are doing their work within a common accountability framework, as I've described it, that ensures that work is done across the organization consistently and consistently pulling that organization in the same direction. The clarity of accountability that leads to clarity of action and clarity of interaction also leads to a, to a trusting culture. So if, every, if everyone knows what they're accountable for, and if everyone knows what everyone else is accountable for, and if they understand how they work together, then it is a lot easier to build trust in the organization and for, for individuals throughout the organization to, to trust each other. Uh, that takes so much churn out of the organization that it does create this space in my second bullet here for managers to be able to juggle the various aspects of their work and still create time to do their value added work. So what are the next steps? I think one of the key key elements is, is to think about the difference between performance management and, and, and effectiveness management. Uh, these are related but very different concepts. Uh, so, so performance management is really, I'm going to go on to that in the next slide. I'd just like to, to mention that, that uh, I do have a lot more, uh, more writing on this uh, on my website if you're interested in seeing that. But the key element and the key thing to bear in mind is that performance management is a system around doing things right. So you're, you're looking at delegated objectives, you're measuring achievement, you're measuring performance, you're providing feedback to employees. It's often linked to compensation. So it's all, all about are, are you doing things right? Effective management includes all of that because all of that is really important stuff to happen, uh, but it's also concerned with doing the right things. So granted, a, a lot of progress has been made in, in many organizations in terms of thinking about doing the right things, but in the lack of a clear accountability and authority framework throughout the organization, understanding what those right things are and ensuring that they're appropriately delegated just, uh, just doesn't happen in the right way. So it's, it's getting that balance between ensuring that, that every manager and every employee in the organization is delegated the right things to do and your performance management systems are, are built around that. So in the setting of objectives then, effective management needs to start at the top of the organization. Uh, the CEO needs to approve the strategic plan from the board, uh, needs to work within and seek the approval of the strategic plan, I'm sorry, from the board. And once that's in place, the CEO needs to determine what work he or she can personally do and what needs to be delegated. The CEO then needs to break down the remaining work and as delegated, uh, uh, send, delegate that down the organization to their vice presidents and then ensure that that system is in place so that there's an appropriate delegation of accountability and authority for those objectives, for the context, uh, for the boundaries, right down through every manager to the front line. So this creates a situation where every employee understands from their perspective exactly the work that they need to do and how it ties into the overall organization strategy. So is this easy to do? In one word, uh, sorry, no, it's not. But is there a payoff? Yes. 
and it can be a huge payoff. So imagine if, if you were able to achieve a 20% increase in effectiveness in a 1,000 person organization, that's like hiring 200 additional people at no extra cost. When you think about it that way, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. So in summary, I believe our organization systems are failing us. Uh, the research shows it and Effective Managers is, a, is engaging in some primary research to quantify this. It matters that our systems are failing us. The CEO has a key role and, and often that role, particularly in terms of accountability and, and authority frameworks, isn't well understood. Uh, HR has an opportunity to impact on the bottom line and often doesn't take advantage of that. And managers need to work within that accountability and authority framework. It's a key element that's, that's just often overlooked. Uh, so that brings us to the end. Uh, we started one minute behind, uh, so uh, I was able to keep it to the, uh, to the 45 minutes. Um, I think I'm just looking over at Kevin to see if we have any questions. I think we do have a couple. Um, there, there, there is, an, uh, in addition, a lot of related information on my website, so I really do, uh, do encourage you to, uh, to visit it. Uh, thank you again for registering and logging on today, and, and thank you for your participation. I, I really appreciate your, your putting the time aside. Um, as, as we close the presentation, after the question period, uh, a short survey would, uh, will come up, and I'd really encourage you, please, to, uh, to complete that to help us, uh, help us improve uh, these sessions as, as we go forward. Um, and if you have any questions that occur to you later, please feel free to, uh, to email me. Uh, and this is my email address on the screen, and you also have it in the PowerPoint slides that, uh, that I emailed to you yesterday. So first of all, uh, let's, uh, let's go on to uh, answering any outstanding questions uh, from the presentation. Over to you, Kevin. Okay, thank you, Dwight. Okay, thank you, Dwight. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to remind our attendees that if you have any questions, you can type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel right now. So I'm just going to start off with the ones that have come in so far from earlier in the presentation. So the first question, Dwight, isn't the approach that you're suggesting too rigid for today's world? Oh, thanks, Kevin. That's uh, that, uh, and whoever asked that one, thank you. It's it's uh, it's a good uh, it's a good point, um, and and I did I did raise that earlier. Uh, slightly in terms of uh, of the fact that that the when when you think about an hierarchy in an organization and you draw it up, it does uh, look like it comes with some certain amount of rigidity, and and I guess in some sense it does because you do have a manager and you have managers that are accountable for the work of their direct reports, and if those direct reports are managers, they're they're also accountable then for the work of their direct reports. Um, but but the intent of this is in fact to create a, an accountability and authority framework, not to not to create a rigid system, but to create flexibility because in today's world, the CEO cannot possibly understand uh, the, the environment in which everyone in the organization is working. So, so they can do their SWOT analysis in terms of the strategic plan and they can figure out where they want to be in the next five to 10 years and, and, uh, and, and start working towards that. But in terms of delegating, it's not possible to create a delegation for every individual throughout the entire organization as to how you will answer, you know, how you'll answer this question, how you will deal with that solution and so on. So you need somehow to, to give people the flexibility they need to use their judgment and to use their best efforts to get the work done in the best way possible. And the only way that, that I can imagine that you can do that and, 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 and also ensure that everybody's pulling the organization in the same direction is to have, uh, a way of, of delegating accountability and authority down the organization in a consistent way within context and boundaries that will, will help individuals to make those, uh, make those decisions. That's great. Okay, the next question, Dwight, I think this is kind of a how do we get started first steps kind of question. If we wanted to improve managerial effectiveness in our organization, how would we go about it? Okay, thank you. Another another good question. I uh, I, I tend not to uh, get into that in in webinars because it's uh, every 
individual and every organization situation is, is so different. Um, my recommended starting point is is to really understand what the current situation is in the organization. So if you if you want to change a system, you need to understand the system. And if you want to improve a system, you have to understand where it is that you, you would want to make those improvements. Uh, so my recommendation is 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 understanding that. So the uh, if, if I'm asked to do uh, to help an organization in this way, we typically start off with interviews of the CEO and, and the vice presidents. Uh, just to gather some uh, information from them in terms of what they see as the as the issues and the hotspots in their organization, um, and then from that develop a survey where we actually survey every manager in the organization and gather information from them, so that uh, so that I would be able to sit down with the uh, CEO and his or her management team and and walk through what the current situation is. Uh, what some of the significant, significant, excuse me, issues are in in terms of of managers not being able to be as effective as they feel they can, and then come up with a strategy for uh, for uh, for resolving those. In many cases, it's it's a question of knowing, and and organizations can can make the changes that they need within their own resources. Sometimes things are a bit more complex, and they can use some external management consulting help to uh, to to deliver solutions. And and sometimes uh, I find situations that are significant significantly off the rails enough that that you might need to do uh, something as comprehensive as an organization design review, which is uh, which is the next level of complexity. Okay, that's it. So those are the questions that came in. Uh, I do, uh, I do again thank you uh, everyone for your participation. Uh, do feel free to uh, email me with uh, any questions that you might have. I, I love uh, talking about this stuff, and there's absolutely uh, no obligation. So, uh, so please uh, do feel free to do that, and um, uh, please do fill out the evaluation form at the end. So uh, we'll now uh, log off the webinar, and thank you again for your participation. Bye, all. Hi, I'm Dwight Mahalitz, President of Effective Managers. Thank you so much for downloading the webinar. I hope that you enjoyed it and will find it useful. Feel free to check out other parts of the website for interesting downloads. Most are free, some are at a nominal charge, but I'm sure you'll find lots of interesting tools there and things that can help you be more effective. And in fact, that's what my job is. My job is to help you, uh, help your organization be higher performing. The bottom line is that I want to start where you are, understand your problem, and provide services that can help you solve that problem and implement a solution as quickly and as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Give me a call, drop me an email, I'd love to hear from you, talk about your situation, and see if there's anything that we can do together. Thank you.